All right, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of an introduction while Paul is coming back just to um, to get people familiar with Zoom. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Kyle Pasinski. I'm the director of the Research Institute at Crow Canyon. And the project that Mark and Paul will be hearing or telling you about tonight is a project that I've also gotten the opportunity to be a part of. And so I'm excited to hear their presentation as well. It's been a really um, incredible decade and it's still going. Um, I'd also like to introduce our panelists. If you don't know them, Dr. Mark Varian is the Executive Vice President of the Research Institute at Crow Canyon. He's been uh, at Crow Canyon for, uh, for a very long time. How long, Mark? I started, um, excuse me, I started in 1987. 1987. I was two years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Paul Ermagiotti, an educator at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center and the lead sort of intellectual force on the Pueblo Farming Project. So we're really excited to have them. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before they get started. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, you probably have a little pop-up window in front of Mark's presentation right now, and you probably see me speaking. Um, that's fine, but if it ever gets in your way, you can click the little narrow bar in the upper left-hand corner of that little pop-up window, and it'll minimize the window. So it'll hide the talking heads if you need to see something on the screen that's obscured. And then you can click the, um, the, the little icon that's a rectangle right next to it to get the talking head back. I like it. I like to see who's speaking, um, but sometimes it gets in the way. The other thing is I will be moderating Q&A during, um, during this webinar. So I'm going to be taking questions from two different places, from all of you uh, on Zoom. What you can do is actually there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you should be able to click that and submit a question. So I'll be getting your questions as your um, as Mark and Paul are giving their presentation. And I may interject if there's a particularly salient question to what they're talking about. Um, and then for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, just pop a question in the comments. I'll be monitoring those as well. Um, so with that, I think we're ready. Go ahead, Mark, Paul, take it away. All right. Well, I'll start, and uh, there'll be a kind of an introduction to the project. It'll be six or seven slides. Then Paul will take over and talk about the actual work that we did as a part of the project. And um, then we'll, at the end of the program, we'll talk about some of the results we have from the project. But this has been one of my favorite projects I've worked on since I've been at Crow Canyon, and it's one of Crow Canyon's longest running and most important projects uh, starting in 2007. You could even push that back a little further and continuing uh, to the present. What you see in the images in front of you are uh, clumps of corn from our experimental gardens and many of the colleagues who joined us to plant and harvest those gardens over the years. Some of you are tuned in may have never been to Crow Canyon. It's located right outside of Cortez, Colorado. And this is a picture of our beautiful campus with Sleeping Ute Mountain in the background. Uh, take a minute to read Crow Canyon's mission statement at the bottom of this slide. I'm really proud of the Pueblo Farming Project because it integrates all three of our mission areas. We conducted research as a part of this project we turn that research into educational materials and curriculum. And what I'm really proud of is from the very beginning of this project, we partnered with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office to design the project together from the ground up. So, um, and in that way, the project is designed to not only address Crow Canyon's research and education goals, but goals that Hopi had uh, for their community. Uh, we had to receive funding to be able to do projects cost money, and we had to go out and get funding to support this project, and we got funding from many different granting agencies. One of our best and most consistent partners is the uh, History Colorado State Historical Fund, and among other things, they funded many of the educational products for this uh, project. 
There's a private foundation in California called the Christensen Fund that provided important early funding, including the initial planning meeting that I'll talk about and some of the first years of planting and harvesting. The National Geographic Society Genographic Legacy Fund funded uh, planting and harvesting, I think it was between about 2000, um, oh, 2010 and 2012. Then uh, Crow Canyon had another really important project called the Village Ecodynamics Project that uh, mostly wasn't about the PFP, but the Village Ecodynamics Project did support um, and the National Science Foundation supported the weekly recording that Paul does to record plant growth and to record the environmental variables that are important to plant growth. The University of North Texas also got a NSF grant, National Science Foundation grant, to study ancestral Pueblo agriculture. And they wanted to use our experimental garden fields, the, the Pueblo Farming Project fields, as a part of that project. And one really important uh, contribution that University of North Texas made is they installed monitors in our garden that measure soil moisture and how it changes throughout the year so that we can evaluate the relationship between uh, soil moisture and plant growth. And then finally, the Research Institute at Crow Canyon has been funding the ongoing, since the VAP ended, the um, continued planting and harvesting and consultations with, uh, with Hopi since 2014 to the present. Um, the project had many goals and, and you can read some of these here, but these are the goals we'll be talking about uh, during this presentation. Uh, but what I wanna emphasize is how the project really began uh, uh, with, uh, with Hopi. And one of the real basic things they wanted to know is um, would their traditional planting techniques and their seed would it work in the Mesa Verde region, which they consider to be a part of their ancestral homeland? Um, and that was, that was sort of the starting point uh, for them. But they took it beyond that and really identified uh, ways in which farming is central to what it means to be Hopi and hope that this project is something that can help continue corn uh, and corn farming in their community. So we, we wrote a grant, we got some money to host a, uh, an initial planning meeting, but the idea, the seed for the project was actually planted before that. And that happened in 2005 when I traveled to Hopi to do a consultation for a new uh, field research project that Crow Canyon was scheduled to begin at the Goodman Point unit of Hovenweep National Monument. As a part of doing that project, we had to do consultations with affiliated tribes and Hopi is one of those affiliated tribes. So we traveled to Hopi and we presented the research design for the Goodman Point project to them. And when we finished that meeting and going over the research design, before we closed out the meeting, I asked the Hopi, is there something that's not in here that you want us to study? And they didn't even hesitate. They immediately said corn and corn farming. And I think they did that because of the importance of corn farming to them and their culture. But it struck me as an archeologist that that was a really great idea because we know how important corn and corn farming was to ancestral Pueblo people. Um, we know from studies that ancestral Pueblo families, ancestral Pueblo individuals were getting 75 to 80% of their annual calories from corn. So there's really no more important thing we could study to the survival of ancestral Pueblo people than corn and corn farming. So we host, so uh, we talked to Hopi about doing this project. We, and we um, brought people together they said, we want you to study corn and corn farming, but we didn't know how. So we brought people up from Hopi and also farmers from the Rio Grande. So in this picture is uh, Herman Agoyo, who is from Okeawinge Pueblo, Tom Lucero from Jemez Pueblo, uh, Kevin Shendo from Jemez, um, and there's uh, Louis Haina from uh, Tasuki Pueblo. So there were Rio Grande farmers as well. 
There's also Anglo experts who uh, study ancestral and modern Pueblo farming that came to this. And as a part of this initial planning meeting, that's where it was decided that the way we should study corn is to develop an experimental farming program. Um, and they further at this meeting decided that Hopi should be the lead experts on that. And the reason they decided that is that in the Mesa Verde region in the past, we think that dry farming was the, the most common type of farming. And when we say dry farming, what we mean is that the crops, the only moisture that the crops get is what falls from the sky. Um, and they still practice that kind of farming at Hopi today, whereas Rio Grande farmers uh, predominantly do irrigation farming. So that was the result of our uh, initial planning meeting. The next step uh, had to secure some more funding. And the next step was to bring Hopi farmers to Southwest Colorado to select the fields for this experimental farming project. And uh, we had initially hoped to have this project complement our Goodman Point archeological project and put fields out in the Goodman Point unit. But uh, when we talked to the National Park Service about that, they didn't want those fields there. So from there, we made the decision to have all of the fields on Crow Canyon's campus, which was really probably a better decision because it allowed us to uh, be closer to the fields and visit those fields and record those fields every week. So we brought uh, Hopi farmers up and they use their traditional knowledge to decide where the best places for fields would be. Um, and the way they did that is they know what, what uh, plants on the landscape indicate places that would be good for growing corn. So they looked for those plants. They also evaluated the soils in a variety of other considerations that their, their knowledge as farmers that they learned from their parents and their grandparents tell you uh, how to select a location for a field. Uh, Paul, you were a part of that. Do you have anything else? Uh, yeah. The, um, we had limited locations on campus due to a number of reasons, buildings, classrooms, parking lots. You can see in the background, there's a group of kids outside in the midst of a course. So we couldn't just choose anywhere and everywhere to have these fields. But um, the native evaluation was these were the best locations available that they could figure that would be suitable for farming. Yeah, the best locations on our campus, but not necessarily the most ideal. Well, these are some of the farmers uh, that came up and worked with us. Um, there are a few other people that came up, uh, but these are the ones that came up the most frequently. And I just have to say, um, making friends and having these uh, people as colleagues has been one of the best things in my professional life. Uh, they're, they're great people. Um, they're incredibly smart, incredibly funny, incredibly fun to work with. Um, they... It's also just a real privilege to learn from them about Hopi culture. And um, we really learned a lot uh, beyond just the farming project. Um, looking at this picture is kind of sad for us because several of the elders uh, aren't with us anymore. On the top row, Owen Numkenya, Harold and Raleigh have all passed. Uh, and in the bottom left, Morgan Sufke, has also recently passed. And that's really, um, you know, they are, they were old enough that when they grew up, they were all out in fields every year. And there were very few tractors. Most everybody was still hand planting. So there's just an incredible amount of knowledge that they have that they shared with us. And uh, we're really, really grateful for that. Uh, I want to point out Lee Kuan Wisiwama, who's holding the ear of uh, Blue Corn. At the time the project started, he was the director of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and uh, led the Hopi uh, contingent of this project. And he has since uh, retired and Stuart Koyi Yumptiwa is now the director. And uh, he's our 
he's our main partner that coordinates the Hopi efforts on this project. Paul, do you have anything on the on the uh, rest of these farmers? The only other thing that you mentioned, all their qualities, they had an incredible sense of humor. Everyone so, so much fun working with them. Of course, we only got the jokes that they told in English. And uh, a really great thing about this project was just hearing Hopi being spoken so much, um, even though we didn't understand it. Yeah, we thought they were talking about us every time they spoke in Hopi. Yeah, might have been, might have been. No, they're just, uh, man, it was, uh, it's, uh, I could get a little bit emotional about it because it's so uh, wonderful to have worked with these guys. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he's going to be the primary speaker for the next section of this talk. All right, this is a view of our campus, and um, going across, you'll notice some rectangles there. The, those are the places where our gardens are located. And then there's some little um, yellow and red dots, and those are spots where we set up uh, some temperature monitors. Um, three of the gardens were chosen by the native folks, and uh, there are two other gardens, the one in the uh, sort of furthest to the uh, la uh, right, that garden was already in existence as an educational garden. Uh, we were using it part of our uh, classroom, outdoor classroom. And the furthest one up on the horizon, that was a garden that was started uh, way back in the early 90s for an experiment, and then it was abandoned, and then we uh, reincorporated it into our um, our, our program. But the temperature monitors, I'm going to talk more about those later, were a way for us to keep track of um, any temperature change and uh, changes in the environment. They recorded temperatures every 15 minutes throughout the year. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, here's an aerial view of campus and uh, the five gardens. And what I want to point out is in the center, a little to the right, that's the, that's the canyon itself. That's the low spot. And um, to, the, um, um, to the right, there's two gardens that are located in drainages. And then on each side to the right and left, they're the uplands that are either pinyon juniper or sagebrush covered. And those areas would have had the best soils, but we wanted to try a variety of gardens in different locations. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Oh, I should just point out quickly that those yellow lines were different soil types. But anyway, in 2015, we decided to add an additional garden that was off of our campus. And Mike Coffey, who's pictured here, and he's the father of one of our uh, fellow employees, um, he generously donated a spot in uh, some of his fields, which are located in prime uh, dryland bean farming areas up in, about uh, 30 miles north of campus. And the site is about uh, over 1,100 feet higher. And um, the soils were just incredible. We'll get into those gardens later, but it was just an amazing thing to have this garden compare to compare against the gardens we had on campus. Yeah, notice that the uh, difference in elevation, you may have said that, Paul, but uh, uh, gardens on campus at 6,200 feet and uh, Mike's field at 7,300 feet, much, much higher. Also, that picture at the left, we didn't add this garden until 2015, but we actually took the farmers out there during the time that they came to select the gardens just to talk to a local farmer. And it was amazing how quickly they bonded with each other over farming and just immediately were talking farming to each other. It was really neat to see. So here's an image. Uh, we set a temperature monitor transect across um, campus, across the canyon, to be able to look at things like cold air drainage. And temperature monitor one, which is on the right side, 
um, is about 125 feet higher than the monitor, the little triangle in the center. That one's at the bottom of the canyon. And something became apparent pretty quickly that um, the average frost-free growing season, continual days without any freezing temperature for the uh, monitor number one on the right side was about 148 days. The one in the center at the lowest point on campus was about 95 days. Now, if you talk to any good farmer, they'll tell you that to grow corn successfully, you need about 125, 120 frost-free days. So that garden in the bottom is cut short by over a month, yet it still was able to produce um, over many good years. So right away, we were learning about the effects of this uh, cold air drainage. Although this year, uh, we had incredibly early frost and late frost, and that garden did lose production uh, because of a really, really short growing season there. Yeah, we had a frost on June 22nd. And then another one in August or September. It was, yeah. So this is just an idealized plan to think about strategy and um, you could choose an upland field that has some deeper soil and uh, it gets good rain but you know moisture water flows downhill but uh, so does cold air so if you think about planting in the bottom where you could get some extra moisture because of runoff you have to tend with a shorter growing season so this must have figured into ancient people's minds I think the majority of fields probably were chosen to be uh, on, in the uplands uh, just to account for that shorter growing season in the low areas. So we're gonna go through the gardens here real quick. And uh, this garden we call the Czech Dam Garden was um, at the time, of choosing the fields, this area was looked at because the sagebrush was so much higher, a good five to six feet tall than any of the surrounding areas. And uh, when the sagebrush was cleared, we uh, were quite surprised to find um, an ancient feature. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, this is what we call a check dam. And check dams were placed to increase uh, agricultural areas by placing a low, let's call it a dam or a wall across a drainage. And as water would run downhill after a rainstorm, the water would be slowed down and uh, soil would be deposited behind it. So this has become one of our most productive areas. And it's real interesting to think that we may be growing in an area that was farmed over 800 years ago. Yeah, when we first, um, when we were selecting those gardens in 2007 and we were picking this spot, uh, Lee Kuan Wisi woman noticed just a couple of stones. You couldn't see the check dam. Um, and uh, Paul and I went out a couple of weeks later and cleared the field and that's when it became uh, clear that it was a check dam and before we started uh, farming in here with our exper experimental farm we actually recorded this as an archaeological site we mapped it and did a profile and collect some uh, sediment and pollen samples and um, uh, then started working this field Okay, this is a garden we call the Pueblo Learning Center garden because it's on the way to one of our outdoor classrooms and it's situated in a uh, west facing drainage. You can see how much lower the sagebrush is than the last picture, even though the soils are supposed to be the same. Uh, the soils here are really sandy and they're really quite similar to those at Hopi, but they're shallow and because of the slope, uh, these soils tend to dry out pretty quick. So this hasn't been one of the better gardens. Just for the quick note, you'll notice the little uh, white flowers in there. They're wild tobacco. 
Okay, you want to talk about, you can see the tobacco in the foreground. Yeah, Paul, um, so we harvest that and it's uh, important for people at Hopi today. Paul, Paul distributes that. This right. is a drone image uh, that um, Grant Coffee is our, among other things, he does many things here at Crow Canyon, but he's our drone pilot and he's Mike Coffee's son. Um, and so this shows those three gardens uh, in that are, you can see number one, how close they are together. And yet later when we see the yields, you'll see how they have really different yields. And what you can see in this picture on the right is the location of the check dam, the CDG garden, and how it's in that area of bigger sage. And you can see how as that's a drainage that would only run during a really intense uh, thunderstorm that hit right in the right spot. And water would run down that drainage, the check dam would do the way Paul described it. And you can see how that fans out. We could have actually put that garden probably lower down that drainage and it might have done even better. And I also look at this picture and think how a ancestral Pueblo farmer or a modern Hopi farmer might just chart out that whole area of uh, high sagebrush and make a much larger field in this location. You can see how we put the PLC garden, the Pueblo Learning Center garden, at the very top of the drainage. And had we moved it further down, uh, it might have been a little more productive as well. And then you can see Paul's old garden that is down in the floodplain uh, where Crow Canyon is located. Mark, we have a question. Yeah. Um, Shannon wants to know, did we clear any of the fields by burning? No, that's a really good question because uh, some scholars have argued that that's the way it would have been done. And, and that the burning actually would have created a bump in the, the soils that would have made them even more uh, fertile for a few years. But um, our, some of the uh, executives at Crow Canyon uh, were afraid we would burn down the whole campus if we did that. So we, we got out picks and, uh, you know, they, around here they call it grubbing sagebrush. So. Okay, this, this garden um, was actually started uh, before the project for an ex, um, uh, sort of an experiential place for our school groups to see a garden on campus. So this was started in 2003. And uh, he, like we've been saying, even though it's got a, a much shorter growing season, it does tend to do pretty well. Yeah, and I've got to give Paul his credit here because he just thought we couldn't be bringing kids to Crow Canyon and have them not see corn. I think that was the inspiration uh, for him starting this garden. And so it's a really, really great experience because it doesn't look like modern corn, as you'll see when Paul starts talking about the planting methods. Okay, this is called the Pit House Garden, and you can see sort of the earthen mound which is a replica of a seventh century earth lodge. And uh, it's, it's also one of our outdoor classrooms. So we thought this would be a good location. It's got a north facing slope and it did well for a couple years, but then it soon petered out. And we discovered after doing some soil testing that this area was heavily disturbed uh, due to construction. We even found concrete and things like that in the ground. So we ended up abandoning this field just because it wasn't very productive. So tell them about that plant in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, that's called uh, bee plant, and it is edible. You can use it and eat it like a wild spinach, and it was also used to make uh, a source for painting the black and white pottery. So Paul and I fight over this because the Hopi say – that you can't have anything competing for soil moisture. The Rio Grande farmers who irrigate do let uh, productive weeds grow like this or sunflowers or tobacco, but they can do that because they've got irrigation water. Uh, but, you know, Paul's a potter, so that's a pretty valuable source of paint for pottery for Paul. 
We've got some great questions that have rolled in. Um, when you all are ready, they have to do with uh, how we planted the garden. So, you know, we're going to come up on that one. So let's get to there and then we'll get them asked when Paul talks about the planting methods. Sounds good. Okay, we're almost done this section. This is uh, Karen's Upper Garden with Sleeping Ute Mountain in the background. And it's um, an upland garden that is as close as we can figure to the kinds of places that would have been planted in the past. In fact, this location is surrounded by a number of um, early archaeological sites. But to our surprise, this garden just never uh, panned out very well which helped us to understand that soils can be real localized. Um, what might be good uh, 100 yards away might not be good in this location. Yeah, and to our untrained eye, this just looked like a good spot. It was on the mesa top. There were deeper soils than would be in the canyon. Uh, there's an archaeological site right next door to it, um, and yet it never worked. So at one point, I brought Mike Coffey to campus and had him evaluate all of our gardens from his perspective as a farmer. And when he saw this one, he said, no, this soil is too pink. And he didn't, he immediately thought it was lacking and wasn't the best place for a garden. And this is what led to us. We knew we needed to evaluate this Mesa Top location because we think it's important. And that's what, that's what led us to ask Mike if he would pick out a field for us on his farm. And there it is. Okay, and this is our prime garden and it's located in um, excellent dryland bean country. Uh, this garden has really deep, rich, windblown soil. And he picked the best spot, which is um, slightly north facing, which will protect um, the, the evaporation in the midsummer. And yet it slopes away enough that the cold air drains away from it. So even though it's over a thousand feet higher than our gardens, it has a longer growing season. And as you'll see later, it's been incredibly productive. Yeah, and if you'd have asked me that it, it, could you grow corn at 7,300 feet before this garden, I would have said, boy, you just have too many problems with freezing. But turns out it's just the opposite. This one has, as Paul just said, a longer growing season. Okay, so the Hopi provided the seed for us. And um, their word for corn, I'm going to try to say this is ka. So you can see in this picture just some of the diversity uh, of there's there's at least 16 varieties that are recognized at Hopi and each has a, a different quality the different colors are chosen for uh, the length of the growing season some um, yield earlier in the season than others uh, some of them are used um, in certain recipes some of them can be prepared prepared in different ways and corn is real important in terms of ceremony as well. So all of these corns um, have their own sort of unique place in the Hopi culture. So we can go to the next slide. So what we decided to, to uh, sort of have some better control of our experiments is we uh, narrowed it down to two kinds of corn. We chose the Hopi uh, blue corn and the Hopi white corn. And these are probably the two that are grown most often at Hopi today. They're what we call flower corns. They're, they grind easily into a very fine flour that can be used for a number of recipes. They can be roasted. They can be boiled. But uh, they're also used in ceremonies. And cornmeal is used uh, frequently for prayer offerings, maybe the same way that you might think that um, water is used in a Christian church. Okay, next. So now we can talk about planting and hopefully this will answer some of the questions. So just to understand how different corn farming is at Hopi than the way we think about a modern corn farm. First off, the seeds are planted with a hardwood digging stick called a soya. 
And today they often use a, a metal pipe with a flattened bar welded to the to the other to the, the digging end of it. So when they dig a hole, they dig a hole that's about eight to ten to twelve inches deep and only a couple inches wide until they encounter some moist soil. Then they drop in anywhere from eight to 16 seeds, and they loosen the soil at the bottom of the hole, so there's uh, sort of some breathing room around that. And then the soil is put back in the hole with the, with the last soil to come out going back first which ensures that these seeds will always be in contact with nice moist, moist soil. Uh, then the other thing that's really different is each clump is spaced about two to three good paces apart. So it's about six to eight feet uh, in any direction. So this allows the maximum amount of space for the roots to reach out before they in, encounter any competition. So Kyle, are there questions at this point that would fit right here? Yeah, you've already answered a couple of them, but um, someone asked a good question. How often do the Hopi tribal members and elders visit over the course of the year or the growing season? Well, um, from 2007 until a couple of years ago, they came twice a year to help plant and to help harvest. Often they would be up here for other business during the growing season and they would stop by uh, then as well. But it was primarily at planting and harvesting. We still go to Hopi ourselves every year and uh, work on this project together too, including recently this year in uh, at the end of February, making a trip to Hopi where we took 250 pounds of corn that came from this project and distributed it to uh, Hopi community members through the uh, Stuart Koya Yumptiwa and the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. And then um, I think you'll get into this, but were the plants thinned out when multiple seeds germinated? I'm going to let Paul take that one. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we go to the next slide? So what we did was um, we tried to make observations and document any changes in plant growth and reproductive stages um, on a weekly basis. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that when we first proposed this, how we were going to document all this, the Hopi farmers continually told us that these plants aren't numbers and they're not statistics. But I think amusingly, they allowed us to make our observations. And over the years, they've seen how, uh, you know, we can, we can see changes over time. But um, the main thing is that they view the garden as a home and the plants as their children. And as you approach these, you've got to give them your love and your respect and your encouragement. Uh, they would often kid us for uh, when we would go to the fields they would tell us that we should be singing a song to the children. But anyway, our job was to uh, try to record and document as much as we could. And I just want to point out on the right side, um, Reed Brueger, who's been an invaluable volunteer. He's just helped so much over the years with uh, this project. And I wanted to say thank you to him. So let's go to the next slide, please. Well, Paul, do you want to do the clumps and thinning here or next slide? I want to show that maybe in a second. Okay, so these are some of the things that we documented from the time these emerged to the, out of the ground till the time we harvested, uh, we would be taking notes. So a lot of these stages are thought of in terms of human development. So it generally takes about uh, 10 days for the seeds to uh, show signs of growth to emerge from the soil. And uh, it would be somewhere around the 4th of July that we would thin these. And the way it was explained to us when it was time, you can see in this picture, the leaves begin to bend over and touch the ground. 
And the Hopi folks would equate this with an infant who's trying to take his first steps. When they first stand up, they reach out and try to grab onto something. So it's about this point that we go from, let's say, 12 seed seedlings down to about a half a dozen. So each clump would be reduced from uh, the original number down to about six plants. Yeah, they have words for each of the growth stages. I don't know, more than a dozen words from an embryo to, you know, an old person. And the, the word for this stage is the same. And the, the words for the corn growth stages are the same words they use for people growth stages. And the word for this one is the word they use for toddler. Yeah, we can go to the next. So these are some of the reproductive stages that we focused on. And, and just to think of this again, um, the early stages, the early tassel development and early silk development would be equated to, let's say, a teenager going into adulthood. And the tasseling and silking stages would be equivalent to adult reproductive stages. So they really look at these as if they were growing the same way as people. So one thing I think people don't often realize is that a, a tassel will produce millions of pollen grains. And an ear, each silk is attached to where a kernel will develop. So each of those silks has to receive a grain of pollen to have a fully developed ear. Um, so at this stage of the game, which is about mid, late July, early August, um, timing is crucial because if it remains too hot, the weather is too hot and too dry, the tassels, the pollen will dry up or the silk will dry up. So these are timed to come into reproductive growth about the time that we receive our summer monsoon rains. And uh, that helps things uh, work out. But the past couple of years, we've been noticing with climate change, if that's uh, exactly what it is, that our monsoons have been arriving several weeks to a month later than they uh, should. So that's affect uh, uh, yields as well. Paul, we've got a couple questions about the thinning process that I think are good for this point. Um, one person asks, how, how do you decide which shoots to pull out during thinning? Oh, that's a good question. You just pull some and hope you left the good ones there. So it's, if they all look really healthy, it's hard to determine. You want to open the clump up a little bit to give it a little breathing room. So you just try to pick some that are in between uh, to give the others a little bit of space. But it's, it's hard. And then somebody on Facebook asks, what do you do with the plants that are removed? Well, I either turn them back into the ground or um, our friend Dan Simplicio Azuni told me to take them down to the stream and let them go into the water where they go to Zuni, Zuni heaven. Thank you. Okay, and just some of the pests we've encountered over the years, cutworms, rabbits, um, grasshoppers, birds who've eaten the... Years And I just heard an interesting little um, tidbit that when you plant 10 seeds, the reason you do that is two are for the worms, two are for the grasshoppers, two are for the birds, and two are for us. All right. Are there any other questions for right now? We'll transition here into some of our results. I think we'll okay. see. Uh, yeah. These, this uh, chart's a little complicated. I'll see if I can explain it. Um, it shows the yields from 2009 until 2019 from each of the gardens. And each garden is shown as what we call a box plot. So that red arrow is pointing at the box plot uh, for um, the, my picture is getting covered up on the legend. If you look at the legend on the right, you see the different colors show the different gardens. So that's the uh, check dam garden. 
Now, when a box plot is box and whiskers plot, there's the box and then there's the lines that are the whiskers. Um, that's actually showing the variation between each individual clump in the check dam garden in 2010. The black line in the middle is the most common uh, value for the yield. And if you look at the axis on the left, you can see that the yield is uh, calculated as the kilograms of corn per hectare. A hectare is a thousand meters on a side. Um, so uh, then, so the, the black line is the most common value for a clump. The box has 50% of the variation of the different clumps and the whiskers show 95% of the variation. So what the box and whiskers plot is telling us is that not every clump within the garden produced the same amount of corn. They were variable. Uh, but we can take the average and uh, extrapolate that out to what the, if, if, that, if our small gardens had been expanded to a full uh, 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 hectare, we'd have gotten this many kilograms. Uh, the other thing that's shown on this chart is the inches of rain each year is listed below the year. And it's also shown as the black line. So the scale on the right is the inches of precipitation. So what we can see, I don't know if my cursor shows up, is just what ancestral and modern Pueblo farmers have to deal with. And that is really radical year-to-year -year changes in the environment that is necessary to grow corn. From a dry year to a good wet year, to a bad dry year, another bad dry year, to a, a better wet year, to a bad dry year, to a couple of wet years, to a bad dry year, to a wet year, shown in this chart. And what you can see is how the yields, uh, not surprisingly, correspond to that. The median values on all of the box and whisker plots are a lot higher during the wet years than they are during the dry years. And some dry years resulting in virtually no harvest. Um, 2012 is a year that not only was it dry, but there was a real abundance of rabbits. And even though they're always out there, they hardly ever get in our gardens, but they got in our gardens that year and destroyed our gardens that year. Um, you can also see how the check dam garden and the um, Mike Coffee Garden are consistently better than our other gardens. But it is more than precipitation. Look at 2018, a, a drastically our driest year uh, of all, but there was moisture during that winter. And the Mike Coffee Garden is so good that even though those conditions were so bad, while the rest of our gardens basically failed, it still had production. I'd also tell you to look at 2019, and that's a little deceptive because it's actually the year with the most precipitation, but virtually all of that precipitation came in a near record winter as winter snow that melted and soaked into the ground. And then summer came along and we had virtually no moisture all summer, which made it to where most of our gardens didn't produce much, but our two best gardens, which store the soil moisture the best, uh, the Czech Dam and Mike Coffee Garden, actually had really good yields, even though no summer moisture. Paul, do you have anything else to say? No, just to reiterate that how the, the great difference between the gardens at a higher elevation and our gardens on campus. Yeah, right. You want to take this one, Paul? Sure. So I guess the bottom line is what is what does this all mean and what does it mean for corn to feed people? So this is just um, a rough estimate. If if you had a diet based on 2000 calories, uh, the estimate is that it would take about 160 kilograms and a hectare. It, and a hectare is if you think about it, about the size of two football fields. Uh, that's what it would take to feed a person for a year. So you can look quickly at these estimates and get the idea that our gardens on campus wouldn't be very good unless they were very large. But on the other hand, 
that my coffee garden might be able to feed a large family each year. So, but the bottom line is this whole experiment showed us that, you know, yes, you can grow corn um, under some pretty adverse conditions. And if the Pueblo people lived here for 800 or 1,000 years, they must have been tuned into the best places to grow corn. And uh, in those good years, enough to grow enough food that they could store for those bad years. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, uh, Paul. Storage would have been critical. And living in communities where people shared food would have been uh, really important, too. Um, the um, And going back to both this slide and the one before it, it really does emphasize that different fields would have had really different uh, people planting those would have had really different fortunes. And as population grew over the 700 years from AD 600 to 1300 and more and more people occupied this landscape, there was probably greater variation between people who had farms on the best soils and people who had to settle for um, soils that weren't as good. Uh, so th our project has really helped us think about those dynamics in new ways. So this past um, spring, 2019, we were invited down to help plant in the traditional way at uh, Louis Kuhnwissima's uh, fields. And uh, just to, to give you um, a comparative look at the size of one of their fields, and he had five gardens. Each one would have been used to plant a different type of corn. Uh, so this gives you a much better idea of what it would take to feed a person, a family, uh, a community uh, over the course of time. Uh, this garden was prepared ahead of time by tractor, but all the we did all the planting by hand, the way we talked about earlier. Well, real quickly, I wanted to mention that the Pueblo Farming Project was used to interface between another really important Crow Canyon research project called the Village Ecodynamics Project which was conducted by Crow Canyon and a bunch of other institutions. And the person in the yellow circle is Tim Kohler, who's a professor at Washington State University. And he was the lead scholar on this uh, really important project that Crow Canyon did for uh, over a decade. And the, the project, the VEP does many different things. And I'm just gonna talk about one thing. And that is it uses computer modeling to estimate corn farming yields in the past. Uh, this, is our North, this is our Southwest Colorado study area. It's about 40 miles on a side. And th the computer models that Tim and Kyle worked on, uh, along with other people, to estimate how corn, what the yields were in the past, they took that study area and they divided it up into cells that were 200 by 200 meters on a side and they characterize the soils in each one of those. And there's 100, 114,240 of those spots in that study area. So we know the soils for each of those. Then we use tree rings to figure out the, how much moisture fell every year from AD 600 to AD 1300. We combine the soils and the moisture and a whole lot of other analytical considerations and use that to estimate the amount of corn that could be grown on every one of those 100,000, 114,240 spots on that landscape. So it was a really important study. But some of our colleagues said, how do you really know if your computer model is really accurate in terms of its estimate of yields? So we decided one thing we could do with the Pueblo Farming Project is find the cell in this study area where our gardens were located, find years that had a year in the past, for example, that had the same amount of moisture that fell during 2010, and then compare those yields. And that comparison is shown in this next chart. The dots on this chart are the actual yields from our PFP gardens, and the lines 
are the VEP computer estimates. And we learned a lot of things. I can't go into all of them. Kyle was actually the lead author on an article that got published on this. So you could uh, write us and we could send you that article. Uh, but one thing you notice is it may not be surprising, but the trends are the same. Wet years, the yields go up and are better. Dry years, the yields go down and are worse. And that's true for both the Pueblo Farming Project and the um, and the PFP garden yields. The, the actual comparison between the estimates are in the same ballpark. And that encouraged us that our, our uh, computer estimates uh, were in the same ballpark. In some years, like if you look at 2010 for the pink uh, uh, Paul's Old Garden, they were virtually the same. But there was an important difference between the PFP yields and the VEP computer estimates. And that is that you can see there was a lot more variation with the uh, PFP yields. Dry years, were, were the yields were much lower. And wet years, years really good years, the yields were higher. So uh, the, the, our Pueblo Farming Project data check on our computer estimates might indicate that the, the variation between wet and dry years that ancestral Pueblo people had to deal with were actually more different than our computer estimates suggest. Kyle, do you have anything to add on that? No, that was a good, it was a good summary. It's just that we are exploring ways to enter some of that variability back into the computer simulation due to this study and um, in the Pueblo Farming Project as a whole. That's great. Okay, we're getting near the end uh, and this will be the last chart you have to look at uh, with data, but it really surprised us that uh, after the Pueblo Farming Project had been going on for many years, the Pueblo of Hopi Cultural Preservation Office told us they wanted to do a study of the DNA of modern Hopi corn. They view this corn as something that their ancestors have developed over thousands of years and that is their intellectual property. And they worry about Hopi corn being contaminated with other varieties and especially with GMO varieties. So they wanted this baseline uh, of data for this is what Hopi corn is, the DNA of Hopi corn today. So that's what this analysis shows is the result of this analysis. Uh, it was done by in a couple of different stages, but this stage was done by uh, Dr. Kelly Schwartz, who's at the Gregor Mendel Institute of Molecular Plant Biology in Austria. And uh, many years ago, Kelly was a, an intern at Crow Canyon. Um, if you look at the legend on the left, you see a left-hand column with all those colored dots. And that is native corn or corn that comes from native uh, in each of those different areas of the world. Um, the column on the right with the more subdued colors, those are the 12 samples of modern Hopi corn that Hopi farmers gave us to, do, to use in this project. So when you look at the chart on the right, each dot is an individual sample of corn that had its DNA analyzed. And the plot shows the, the dots that are closest together, their DNA is similar to each other, and dots that are farther apart are more different from each other. So you can see the colors of the Hopi corn all cluster together in the left-hand side that's been circled. They're most similar to each other. Uh, and then they're beyond that circle, they're most similar to uh, corn varieties that also come from the Southwest, but outside the Hopi area. You can see they're most distant from that purple way over there on the right. And if you look at the legend, that's corn from South America. Now all corn came from originally from central Mexico. And you can see that samples from there are represented in this analysis too. So there's lots of different results, but one is that when, you, when we look at the Hopi corn, it clusters together, and yet there is difference between the different varieties. And I would say that indicates that over the millennia, 
Hopi farmers have prized that diversity. And like Paul was talking about earlier, the different varieties have different characteristics that they recognize and want and have used planting and farming techniques to preserve that diversity. And yet there also is overlap between those varieties, indicating that there was some sharing and some mixing between those varieties. That may be how new varieties were created by Hopi farmers, was to deliberately experiment with that. And it may also come from the sharing that we talked about earlier that is so important uh, for this type of farming and for Pueblo farming. Um, you know, the other thing that came from this study is th this is corn that came from uh, roughly uh, 2014. I can't remember the exact year we got the samples. And we, the, Kelly also compared this to Hopi corn that she got from uh, the United States Department of Agriculture. They collected corn, Hopi corn in 1940, and they collected other indigenous varieties. And they're all curated uh, at a place in Iowa, but to keep it viable, they have to grow it out every year in Iowa. And it turns out that the 2014 Hopi corn was different from the Hopi corn that was, that's the USDA corn. Now that could be because the growing out of it in Iowa has changed the Hopi corn from the 1940 to Hopi corn that's now been grown out in Iowa for 60, well, 80 years. Um, and it could also be that Hopi corn in Hopi itself has changed as climate and other factors have changed at Hopi. And it really emphasizes that corn as a plant is incredibly genetically malleable to the conditions that it grows in. Uh, Kyle, are there other things about this analysis that I've missed or that I, I could have said wrong? No, that was great. All right. Oh, all right. So as we wrap this up and uh, if you're interested in any of this, pursuing any of this uh, further, we developed an electronic book. Uh, hopefully you can see the link on the bottom of this that uh, summarizes the project. Um, it investigates the origins and spread of corn over the past 10,000 years. Uh, it shows you uh, how the planting is done. There's a video involved. And we've also incorporated a couple of lesson plans that are geared towards um, middle school teachers. But I think in today's uh, stay-at-home learning environment, um, you could probably adapt these uh, right at home and, and learn a little bit more. I think one of the proud moments is this ebook got cited by um, in the National Climate Assessment that came out last year under the second state of the carbon cycle. So I think that's pretty good that we got recognized on that level. And Paul, can you talk about the charts um, that people could look at in this book and how it's a living book that we update every year? Yeah, you can, you can actually look at the pretty raw data if you really wanted to get into it. There's a lot of tables that can be manipulated and you can see, um, you know, where we got these results if you're so inclined. Great. Well, embedded in that ebook, we also made a documentary film and you could find it in the ebook and play it from there. But you can also uh, find it on Crow Canyon has a YouTube channel. So if you went to Google and typed in Crow Canyon YouTube channel, that would come up. And there would be a, something to click on called video. And that, and if you clicked on video, it would show all the videos uh, that Crow Canyon has made. And you would just look through those and you would find the video called More Than Planting a Seed. Um, it's a 29 minute video. It was made by an award-winning uh, documentary filmmaker named Chris Simon. Uh, it's something we're really proud of. And it's also something that the Hopi are really proud of and really like. And, have shared with uh, their community. Well, we're at the end. Uh, really, these are uh, most of the bullet points on the top of this are uh, things that we went through in this talk that hope we found that Kopi corn does flourish 
using their planting techniques in the Mesa Verde region. Uh, that it sh the DNA analysis, uh, the next two points are what I just said about that. Paul has told you about the importance of cold air drainage and the these micro environmental factors that really affect yields. So you've seen how three of our gardens are within a couple hundred yards, maybe less of each other, and yet they have uh, dramatically different little microclimates and those really affect yields. And that's something that the expert farmers of the past must have known intimately as they searched out places to put their homes and places to put their yields. Um, the PFP in our VEP comparisons has really helped us understand uh, ancestral Pueblo corn production. And there's much more that we can do. And that's why we're continuing this experiment uh, uh, into the future. But I think really the one of the things I learned most was about how Hopi people think about corn. And uh, Paul, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I, I would just say how grateful we are to the native scholars and farmers who've helped us and taught us about how they think about and uh, respect. It's so different from the way most of us approach our food today. We simply go out and pick it up and some of it's already prepared. But um, I've got a little quote here from uh, Stuart Koyemtoa. And he said this in Hopi, and I translated it, and I hope I have it right. But he said, we achieve only by the means of corn, which means that corn is everything, everything from birth, life, uh, through death, everything is involved. So uh, to summarize it, you could say for the Hopi and other Pueblo people that corn for them is life. Yeah, it was... It, those are powerful lessons. So anyway, we want to thank you all for uh, being here. And as they say, uh, the men at Hopi would say, Kukwe. Thank and, you. Uh, the word for thank you, women have a different word for thank you, which is Asquali. And one of the things the Hopi taught us that they they totally believed was that more than precipitation, more than all these things we were recording. They told us it was what it was in your heart with, that you brought to your field that uh, resulted in whether you were successful or not. And uh, that's where the have a good heart and pray for rain title on the top of these slides comes from. So this is a good year for all of you to get out there and uh, plant a garden, grow some food for yourself and, uh, and uh, watch what the plants can teach you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We're happy to take any questions. Wow, that was great. Thank you all. And you people are um, writing in and thanking you for the presentation, but we do have some questions and um, if you're willing to take them. And they're sort of in three different categories. A lot of people want to know about um, corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters. Can you talk about whether we planted any other um, crops as part of the Pueblo Farming Project, and um, specifically what Hopi people say about um, intercropping. Oh, yeah, it's kind of interesting, and I've been trying to track this down. I have a sneaking suspicion that this idea of the three sisters was a very East Coast pilgrim uh, inspired kind of thing because I asked some of our scholars and they said, no, we don't really call it that way, but they can grow beans and squash in the same field. But oftentimes they're planted in other areas that uh, maybe they have a little bit more moisture uh, or, or have a different quality of soil. So for the most part, I don't think that these three plants are intercropped, although they are grown and they all are important. And I think they would say that that would defeat the purpose of what you see in this slide, and that's that spacing. They want no competition between clumps. And if you were sticking even more plants together, at least when you're dry farming, uh, the amount of soil moisture just wouldn't sustain that. Um. 
sort of on the same line, several people ask questions about soil depletion in crop rotation and whether that is practiced at Hopi today, whether it was practiced in our fields, and whether we think that people in the past had to deal with soil depletion. Well, on the Village Ecodynamics Project, we work with a really respected uh, soil scientist who argues that it would definitely be a problem, that it's, um, uh, I'm spacing out right now which nutrient is uh, particularly depleted by corn, uh, but um, go ahead, Paul. Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Yeah. But um, one thing I said to that particular person was, uh, but I know Popey people who told me they've planted the same field every year that their father planted and that their grandfather planted. So um, I think almost certainly there was soil nutrient depletion. You know, they sort of do a, a, um, a fallow by changing where they, by this wide spacing. And they say that when, when we harvest and the corn is that brittle, you know, totally dried up, what they do is they talk about it like they're putting that old person to sleep. It's done its, it's done its thing. And so they tilt it over and leave it there. And then only next year would work that back into the soil. But that also serves as a marker where you are not putting your clump in the next year in the same spot. So you're, you're sort of doing this mini rotation uh, in that way by moving where you plant each year. But that is something that we hope by uh, having our experiment work for the long term that we, maybe we can uh, get new measurements on. Thank you. You know, people got really interested when you were talking about um, the couple of years where we had big pest problems. And so, um, so there were a couple of questions about pests. Um, do Hopi people ever use scarecrows or did we use anything like that? And are there other methods that Hopi people would use to keep pests out of their fields? Yeah. Um, pests are definitely a problem. The earliest ones are cutworms, which will could destroy your crop as soon as they come out of the ground. What they often do is put old coffee cans around them. And, uh, you know, before they put the coffee can, make sure there's no worms. So that's a kind of a modern solution. I'm sure they had something in the past. Um, for rabbits, uh, we were instructed to take dog dung and a specific plant, rabbit brush, and soak the dog, uh, the dog wastes in a can of water and dip the brush into the water and sprinkle it on the plants. Uh, I think we found out that fences work just as well if you can get them up. Um, and yes, I have seen scarecrows, but we also know that the birds aren't fooled by the scarecrows for very long. And, you know, it makes you think just the intimate relationship that ancestral Pueblo farmers may have had with their fields, literally being in those fields every day and like they can see when cutworms start doing their thing and they'll actually eat the guys we work with too. They'll just dig down and grab those cutworms and pull them out and get rid of them. And uh, um, so I imagine because there was no grocery store to go to that there was, um, they were really watching these fields quite carefully and had a presence in the field uh, pretty continuously. I'm not sure that's true, but. Thanks. We have a, a question about um, women's role in growing corn. Uh, it was remarked upon that all of our farmers that joined us were men. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting from what we've learned that how it works is the men are, for the most part, responsible for growing. Uh, planting, weeding, harvesting the corn. But once it's harvested, it's presented at the door of the house and presented to the woman. From that point on, it's her corn. And she stores it, takes care of it, 
uh, grinds it, cooks with it. And when it's time to prepare for the next year's planting, she actually chooses the seed and the type of corn that she wants for the upcoming year. So you're right, it seems like just the men are doing this, but it's actually quite well divided over the course of the year. Yeah, Lee Koot, when we see him, uh, his mom is gone now, but he would always tell really interesting and meaningful stories about his mom and her relationship to the corn. He talked about when he was a kid, when you, when you harvest these clumps, there's like really beautiful, huge ears, but there's always little ears that didn't develop. And he talked about uh, how when he was a kid, he left those in the field and his mom went out there and when she saw that, he really got a scolding that you don't abandon any ear. And uh, she made him bring those these not fully developed ears back to the house. And they sort of got an honored place on the on the stack of corn that was being stored. So once again, just getting back to that totally different relationship to food and to this plant that uh, Pueblo people and Hopi people have compared to most of us in our relationship to our food. Thank you. And then I guess the the last sort of question that people have is, you know, what's next for the Pueblo Farming Project? Where is this project going? Um, and uh, I, there were some particular questions. Do we anticipate expanding to other types of crops? Um, can you speak to that a little? Yeah, there's a couple of things. We just want to keep doing it. It's become so meaningful for us. So even though we, uh, in recent years, we've been doing the planting and harvesting on our own, we still consult with Hopi. Um, and I'm going to talk about another project in a minute that has uh, spun off of it. But we also, as we're trying to make sense of all these data that we're collecting, uh, just this year, we're buying new equipment to better monitor soil moisture and temperature. And so we think there's real value in the long-term nature of this study. And that would go back to the person's question about nutrients. You know, we need to start discussing that and how we're going to uh, measure it. You know, Paul's doing this on top of teaching. So he has to carve out time each week to do this recording. Uh, so it's a it's a challenge in terms of time management for us to do this project, and yet it's become so meaningful to us. Uh, we do want to continue. Um, I know Kellum, who's working out uh, on our uh, current excavation project, he'd like to have a garden out there to assess whether those soils around the sites we're working on now, their productivity. So there's aspects like that. Paul, do you have others to add? Uh, no, I think you got it. And do you want to tell them about the database? Yeah. So, so we came to a point two years ago where we said, okay, we've done this for 10 years. Uh, let's assess. We went down to Hopi and made a presentation to the community. And after that presentation, we met with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and asked them, what should we do next? And what we decided on was a project that's a continuation and a sub-project of the Pueblo Farming Project that we call the Maze Database Project, where we're building a database of all maize in museum collections and repositories, all Southwest maize uh, that's in museums and repositories, and uh, to be available for scientists who want to study maize and for descendant communities who want to learn more about ancient maize. Uh, so we're in the middle of that project. We contacted, we've contacted about 70 repositories and we've gotten spreadsheets back from about 40 of those. And we have something, uh, we have many tens of thousands of accessions uh, of maize that are in these collections. And so we, we put together a really good team that consists of Hopi experts, uh, Kelly Schwartz, the geneticist, a woman named Sarah Ose, who's a uh, botanist who studies uh, Pueblo people's use of plants, both ancient and modern. Uh, so it's a really exciting team to be working with, and uh, we're really excited about moving forward with that project as a new dimension of the Pueblo farming project.
Thank you. And then I guess the last question, and then we can wrap this up, is, um, is it only corn that Pueblo people treat with such respect? It's been really striking to hear you all talk about um, about maize and the importance of maize to uh, Hopi and Pueblo people. Is it just corn or or other crops? You know, that's a good question. And, you know, we focus so much on corn, but I think there's just a general respect for all living things, um, whether it's wild tobacco or um, the bee plant or beans or birds or whatever. It just seems to me that there's just a general uh, different outlook on life than how, how most of us think of it. But I think we and they have focused mostly on corn. I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Well, you know, Jim Potter and I published an article with uh, the Santa Clara Pueblo scholar Tito Naranjo. And what Tito taught us in that publication was that there's a philosophical concept among Pueblo people that every everything on this planet has a life force. And that includes rocks. And that... Um, that uh, of a Pueblo philosophical concept is seeking that life force and seeking harmony in that life force. So I think they extend what we've been talking about with corn to all of creation. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And thank you for your comments and questions. I've been furiously typing answers to some of the simpler questions that we haven't gotten to. So if we haven't answered your question live, check the Q&A because, um, because I have likely answered it uh, through typing. And, um, and thank you all for joining us. Be sure to tune in um, next time. I know next Thursday, we have Stephanie Crabtree, Dr. Stephanie Crabtree from U Utah State University talking about how um, she's doing some innovative work reconstructing ancestral Pueblo food webs. She's one of our research associates at Crow Canyon. And we've just got a full lineup um, coming down the pipe. So stay tuned and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Dylan. You're thank welcome. You. This was out fun. There. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to keep answering some of these questions. I'm trying to remember we use like a resistivity monitor for our soil moisture. It's not a tensiometer. I noticed Patrick Stabe, Staub is out there and he's a... Uh, he's been asking a lot of good questions. Yeah, his father runs uh, the city tavern back in Philadelphia. Nice. No way. Huh. Have you ever been there, Paul? I can't afford it. I'd <laughs> like to. <laughs> anyway.